God. Oh, you are so good, Lord.
give you glory this morning. Praise your holy name. All the angels praise your holy name. I will to roll. My soul rejoices in you. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. Lord, I can only imagine What will my heart feel when I dance for you, Jesus? Or in awe of you, be still. Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. So in this passage of scripture that we're looking at this morning, I just would like to talk to you a few moments about a subject that we'll call that which is unshakable, that which is unshakable. In the first passage of scripture that we read, it is so good and so powerful to see how God looks when he comes around people in the old covenant. And so in today, I'll give you just just always how much to, to give you. So I'm going to just give you a few one-liners here this morning. I hope yours are the same as mine. Okay, Old Testament. Uh, so usually there's two things that happen. 
uh, in the scriptures. You have an Old Testament. In fact, right in the middle of our Bible, don't we? We stop reading the Old Testament, and then it says the New Testament. And so we have these two Testaments, and they are signified by two hills that we've looked at here this morning, or we will. One is Old Testament Mount Sinai. That's where God met with mankind on the mountain without the new covenant, in the old covenant, in the Old Testament, with lamb sacrifices. Can you imagine a little four-year-old kid? He wakes up in the morning and he's like, Dad, what is that smell? It's like, well, son, that's all of those lambs and sheep and bulls that are being... Dad, what, what are all of those knives and all those animals that are uh, that they're being killed? Yes, son, that's, that's part of what we have to do to come to God. And then if a dad gets angry, cusses, pushes some stuff around, what do you got to do? You have to go and get a lamb. It's never something out in the woods, and it's never a, a wild animal. It's always a domesticated animal. It's always something you have already an affection for, some little innocent lamb. You take that lamb. You got to go stand in line. You got to go to the priest. You got to work through that whole thing. And we, especially the further we get away from the literal crucifixion of Christ, which 2,000 years has passed, we lose our reverence and we forget all about how it was in that Old Testament. Then there is another mountain. It's called Mount Zion. Mount Zion. And that Mount Zion is referred to in the Old Testament and the New Testament. When it talks about Mount Zion in the Old Testament, it's speaking prophetically of how it will be in the New Testament. And so you have these two mountains, you have these two covenants, you have these two testaments of the old and the new, and that is part of our contrast that we need to have in our minds. So, first of all, let's look at a few kingdom uh, dynamics. Uh, the first one is a contrast between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Even today, today's date is August the 2nd, 2020, right? Do you know that, where do we come up with that date? It's not Israel's date. What, what are we with the Israel calendar of 50... Five, uh, no, 57, 82, 80, 57, 80. That's where we are right now. Uh, and, and so we certainly don't go by that calendar, do we? Um, we don't say it's 57, and it, it probably is <laughs> in reality. Their, their calendar is definitely closer to our calendar. But Christ was so powerful in his presence and his entering into the world that it, it divided what we call... Um, I'm trying to think of the new words, uh, the, the common era and um, the, the former, what's the one before? We used to call it uh, in the year of our Lord, A.D., B.C., right? That, that, that division mark is there. That's because we have a kingdom dynamic of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament we don't think about this very often, but how people dealt with sin, how they dealt with civil life. Civil life in the Old Testament was, it was, they mandated that at least the men, a lot of times men, women, and children, depending on if the wife was having a child at home or something, she wouldn't go. But typically they would all go to the temple at Jerusalem, no matter where they lived, no matter, they could live in Africa or different parts of the world. They were mandated three times a year. And the story of Jesus when he was 12 years old in the temple, that's all part of that. And uh, I think that was 82 miles away for them. And that was by walking to get there at the time. And those were part of the festivities that they had in that Old Testament. And so Hebrews, this book of Hebrews, it's all about contrast. In fact, the first verse of the book of Hebrews, it said God in past times spoke to us <clears throat> in various manners, like he did on this Mount um, Sinai, bringing the law, the fire, the lightning, the thunder, all of that that happened with them. God spoke in those times, but he said, in these days, everybody say in these days, he has spoken to us by his son. And so a lot of people think that the Old Testament, in fact, I have a New Testament that I had with me this morning. It's like, you know, that Old Testament isn't that important. Just keep that New Testament with you and you're good. 
and I don't disagree with that, but you will never understand the New Testament if you don't have an understanding of the Old Testament. I will promise you this, you will never, ever, ever understand the book of Revelation unless you understand the Old Testament. You will not. I don't care how many books you read, how long you go to seminary, how much you study it. If you do not understand that Old Testament, you will not have a clue of what it means. And I've, I've taught through the book of Revelation three times, and I'm still, yesterday I was reading in Jeremiah, and it's, just, it, it, it's quoted 18.4, which I won't say, but uh, it's quoted right out of the book of Jeremiah, and it's just like, if you don't get that, so never think ever that it is waste of time or that when you look at the Old Testament, that's this uh, crusty old God. That's what they told me when I was in high school. They said that uh, in my was it history class, civics class, one of them, they said, uh, they said God in the Old Testament, he was a mean God. He was a terrible God. He would punish you for your sins. Now we have a happy God. Now we have a nice God. That's what they told me. I'm not kidding you. And so I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm like, you know, I'm not the smartest kid maybe in this class. But if he changes from a bad God to a good God, who's to say that he's not going to change into a bad God again? Or who's to say that he's not going to do something else? How many understand that our God never changes? But his relationship with people changes in our understanding because of the covenant. And I can't stop myself from going to the cross where Jesus took upon himself all of the penalties. He fulfilled all of the Old Testament regulations in his own body. He took upon himself. And so we who come to the Lord, we can come to God directly through Jesus and we don't have to have that Old Testament, but it's sure good to have an understanding of what that is all about. And so... <clears throat> We want to enter into this kingdom life. You are already in this chapter 12, and I'm just going to encourage you, if you would, just to back up to verse 18, just for a few moments, 18 to 21. Listen to these verses. Now, it's very close to what was already read this morning in the Old Testament, but it's not the same. Listen carefully. Here we go, verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that may be touched and burned with fire and blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that what was heard, it would beg the word not to be spoken among them any more, for they could not endure what was commanded, bringing the Ten Commandments, and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned or it will be shot through with an arrow. And so terrifying was this sight that Moses said, I do exceedingly quake and fear. And by the way, that's the verse that Quakers get their name of their meeting from because they apparently quaked. Um, and we're going to find out about some quaking and shaking here before this is over. But um, that's where they get their uh, understanding of their, their background. So we did not come to Mount Sinai we did not come to blackness and fire. We did not come to a word that was spoken through trumpets. Just that, it's that ram horn trumpets. I was listening to several different trumpet sounds on the uh, on my iPhone, whatever. And, and they had a whole bunch of trumpets that sound like we sound in our trumpets. That's not the sound that they had. Our trumpets today sound pretty good. They'll, they'll make you happy if you have a happy trumpeter, right, behind it. But those, those hideous sounds, and it was continual, and it was louder, and it was louder, and the smoke was coming, and the lightning was striking, and the thunder was clasping, and the power of God was there, and... God is like, and by the way, Moses, if, a, you know, your little dog happens to run up there, kill it now. So holy, right? It's what's an animal, man or beast would be killed if they go up into this mountain. Everybody say, wow. We have not come to that. It was so intense. Moses himself said, I do exceedingly. It's freaking me out, is what he would say today. So, let's continue. Look at the next verse. Now, Hebrews, especially Hebrew people, 
they think this way. They think in terms of contrast. It says, but you have come to Mount Zion, verse 18, <clears throat> or maybe 21. But you have come to Mount Zion. So what are you contrasting with? Mount Sinai to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an uh, innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the firstborn, to those who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, who is the me mediator of the new covenant, to the blood that is sprinkled that speaks better things even of, than that of uh, Abel. And so what is it saying here? that you have not come to this smoking, lightning-infested, thunder-clasping mountain. You have come to Mount Zion. You have come. How many thank the Lord for that? Now, I want to put this in here just so you, you, you can get a, a, a mental picture of this when you study the Bible. Now, it's very important that when you're looking at the Bible that you kind of take on this mindset. And that mindset is that the kingdom of God, most people today, whether they say it or not, they think that the kingdom of God and the church are the same thing, and they are not. We say, blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, that's what the church is supposed to do. We say, blessed are the meek, for they shall... Well, that's what Christians are supposed to do. And it's like, no, no, the, the, the church is part of the kingdom, but the church is not the kingdom of God. If the kingdom of God is anything, it's these eight things that are laid out here. It's to a heavenly Jerusalem, it is, which is a city. It is uh, innumerable a company of angels, so many. So angels are part of the kingdom. This sense of the, this mountain, uh, you've come to the city of the living God, to the general assembly of the firstborn, th whose names are registered in heaven. How many are here today, your names are written in heaven, say amen. Amen, it's really important that you make sure that your name is written in heaven. And then the judge of all, the spirits of just men made perfect. And so when we come before the assembly of the Lord today, I like what Steve said, because we want, we come, this is not just about setting tables up and putting a camera up and making sure we have PowerPoint and making sure that chairs are in a certain place and the temperature is a certain thing and all this and that. That's all part of it, but that is not really what we're all about. Why? Because it's a dual thing. Number one, we are physical people, so those kind of things have to happen. But we're also spiritual people. We also connect with God here. We also worship God here. And so I'll talk more about that in a moment here when we get to our next one. But these are what I call kingdom dynamics. And we need to understand that this kingdom, this, this presence, this which is unshakable is where God wants to take us from where we were. And by the way, if people are not Christians, they still want to recognize God in some kind of a physical way. And I'll mention that here. Secondly, is the source. The source of our identities. There are two. Well, there's more than two, but I'm going to use two today. Heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. The earthly realm. That's this physical realm that we work with, that we live, that we breathe. Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, we kind of look sometimes as our humanity as a curse, just because we, I don't know if anybody, but you know, we're always having, you're, you're growing older, or something hurts, or you get infection in a tooth, or you try to work through something, right, Dale, and you, you hear this medical thing, and, and you, you know, you try, your body gets over one sickness, and then you're fighting another, and, or sometimes you work with a relationship, and you know, you about get that, and something else breaks out. It's like running a business, right? And so it, all of this stuff happens. And yet we are the only entities anywhere on any planet, any geographical location where we have physical bodies, we live physical life, but we also relate to God. And somehow God is bent on making this happen. He wants people down here 
on earth to relate to him up there, even with our sinful bodies, even with our broken cultures, even with our government that usually can't figure out which way is up or which way is down, right? Backwards or forwards, they don't get it. And God put us here and he wants us here. And we are the only reason that God is still working with this earth. He loves us. He wants to save us. He wants to help us overcome our flesh. He wants us to learn to let our power broker inside of us be the spirit of God rather than just our own intellect and trying to work out everything ourselves and, and all of that. God wants us to bring his kingdom right down in this darkened, broken, fallen world and bring his majestic glory to himself so he can look and he said, I did that. It worked. Now, I don't, I've, I've taken on a lot of challenges. I've read a lot of books about people who have taken on challenges. But ladies and gentlemen, I've never heard of any entity ever, anywhere, taking on the whole world over centuries and millennials of time to prove the point that he is God and he will have a people no matter what happens in the government, no matter what happens and how many people reject him, he'll have eight in a boat floating in the middle of it and say, I did that and I'm going to keep this human race going. I'm going to rebuild it again. That's why when people tell me about America, it's over. We're going to hell in a handbag. No, we're not. We're believing God to change the fabric of America. And before things can be fixed, they have to be broken. A wrecking ball is not just to wreck things. It's to uh, tear down what is not essential and to put in what is essential and what we are going to hold on to. So sometimes in these shakings, which we're going to get to, we have to understand the source of our identities because God has not called us just to live by our earthly understanding, our natural minds, our physical abilities. And we can do a lot. And the younger you are, the more you potential that you have. Except you're only lacking one thing, and that's wisdom. And you only get that when, it's, when you're older. But God has never taken an old man's head and put it on a young man's body yet. Somebody say amen. And so we're to use the resources of heaven to bring the glory to the Lord. And so we have to understand these two identities. The other one is the heavenly one. It's, it's not seen by the natural eye. And by the way, even a lot of Christian people still go by this. Do you remember after the resurrection, there was a guy by the name of Thomas? And he, you know, you can hear him. Unless I take my fingers and I put them into the, unless I, Feel it, lest I take my hand and I thrust it into his side. I want the evidence. Okay, Tom, come here, buddy. <laughs> Do it, touch it, feel it, it's there. Blessed are those who are not. What is he saying? It's okay, but Thomas, you don't have to live by just natural facts and feelings. There is what's called revelation of the Spirit. God can talk to you. God can communicate something. And that's the difference between a Christian who's following Jesus and a church-going person who claims Christianity as a religion. It's different. I have a book from my wife's college days. It's called, it's about that thick. It's called The, Re the Religion of Christianity. And it's like, yes, it's thorough. Yes, it's good brilliant guy who wrote it yes 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 but we're not just well we're christians you're a muslim you're a hindu they're all equal and is it there are religious overtones to christianity but it's very he says religious obligations is to do this right feed the hungry take care of the fatherless and widows that's all it says about religion when he uses that word true religion is and so your book wouldn't be that wide. It would be a little pamphlet with one verse on it that talks about our religious aspect of it. The rest of it is kingdom life, kingdom dynamics relating to God through the spirit. It's a spiritual realm. It's a spiritual book. It's a, it's a spiritual prayer. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's spiritual revelation. It's what said to Jesus 
Who am I? Who do men say that I am? You're this, you're that, and the other. Peter's like, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You got it. You did it. You didn't learn that from your mama's knee. You didn't learn that from your rabbi. You learned that from your father who's in heaven. That's what I'm talking about. God can talk to you. I get out in my garden, my wife's garden. All I do is build buildings. She takes care of everything else. Except I run this tiller through there. But, you know, I'm working with this tiller, and pretty soon I'm, I'm running this tiller all over, and it's like, you know, my heart is kind of like that ground, and it plants a seed, and these verses start coming. And God just, he talks to me through the natural, through the spiritual. We learn the natural, right, by learning the, the spiritual. So that's the source of our identities, and God wants to take us not away from our humanity, but he doesn't want us to be limited by our humanity. That's why he says, when you go to the courtroom, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to say in that day. So what is Peter doing? The night he's going to, the next day he's going to die. The next day he's going to stand right. They just killed James. Peter was going to be killed the next day. What was Peter doing? He was sleeping. He was sleeping in the prison. What's going to happen tomorrow? I better take care of this. I better take. He's like, God's got this, right? That's the way we need to live in this reverence and presence of God and who he is, not to live by any earthly source at all. And then this pushes the envelope to what I'll call the purpose for shakings. Now, God says he's going to shake. Remember, he uses the picture of the ground shaking and the presence of God coming. I think it was Amos who picks up on it. Uh, one of those Old Testament prophets, I believe it was Amos, if I remember right. And he, um, and he, he quotes that verse in, in here. And he says, I'm not going to shake the earth only, but also heaven. Okay, so how do you shake heaven? He's not talking about shaking the earth like an earthquake. He's talking about earth, earthy things. He's going to shake things that are earthy. Right now, our United States of America is being shaken. We've never experienced. I talked to people pre-World War uh, II, far, some of them back almost to World War I, and I asked them, has America ever? No, no, America's never been. Like, we've never, right? So God says he's going to shake not only the earthly, but he's going to shake the heavenly. That means the church in America right now, and probably around the world, I can't speak for every church, but God shakes families, God shakes churches, God shakes relationships, God shakes marriage. First time you get into a conflict with your husband or wife, it doesn't mean you kick her out the door or you leave her. God is shaking it. You need to get rid of something that might be a temper. It might be that little baby attitude that you feel like people are picking on you all the time. It might be you are a control freak and you need to let somebody else besides yourself, somebody say amen. And you need to, the reason there's shakings in marriage is not to break them up. It's to shake them up to make them better. And I watch people when they go through these shakings, their, their marriage is better than ever. Their churches are better than ever. There, there's times, and, and every church goes through this. We've gone through it. I've been here for a lot of years. I've watched a lot of shakings going on. A lot of, there's a whole lot of shaking going on, let me tell you. And, you know, with this, and, and you watch this, and, and you watch half your congregation go to another church, and they're bragging about their youth groups, and I count them, and there's more from our church than their church, and makes you spit. But you know what? It's God's church. It's God's people. It's God's way. It's God's thing. Amen? My job is to be faithful to what God's called me to do. Let him shake his church. Let him shake the marriage. Let him shake the country. Let him shake things. We don't like shakings. But there's a purpose in shakings, ladies and gentlemen. And it's the same thing that happens. Every single storm in our yard, I have to go through and I have to pick up a hundred plus little limbs because they're not necessary anymore. Most of them are dead. They're not dead producing anything and it needs to go away so the tree can grow and the bible says let me read the verse it says i'm going to shake not only the the earth but also the heavenly that voice that shook from heaven i'm in verse 26 and he promised yet one more i'll shake not only the earth but also the heavens the heavenly 
Now this once more, the removal, everybody say the removal. The reason you go through trials sometimes, the reason you get so angry sometimes, the reason you get so frustrated you could take a can and kick it down the road for a mile is because God is shaking something out of you that you don't need anymore. That, but it's not only removal of those things, but it's also the things which cannot be shaken can remain. What's going to remain in you? Your faith in Jesus, your love for one another, your commitment for the Lord. So, I, I, born, I was born in 1955, and my cousin called me, and he, well, he showed me this picture of this beautiful 1955, I think it was a Chrysler 300. And the only reason I was interested in it at all is because it was a 55. If it had been a 54, or a 56, or 57, I wouldn't have really cared. But this thing was beautiful. <laughs> just, I get excited just thinking about it. I got pictures, I'll show it to you if you want to see it. Anyway, and so this guy is getting older, and he wants to get rid of it, and uh, he shows me the receipts, got $40,000 in chrome parts renewed in this car. It's beautiful. It's a 1955 and, and, and he has and, and you know no ill motive and, and he told me the price is a pretty good price and, and I, but I just didn't feel like the Lord wanted me to do that and I bought enough things in my life that were wrong. Anybody here ever bought something was wrong? And you buy it, you know you shouldn't buy it but you bought it I mean, ladies especially, buying clothes. It's like, you know, they don't fit right. Or I don't know. I don't get that. Never mind. Back that up. Take that up. Here's, here's the thing. And it's like, you, okay, I'll buy myself a pair of pants. It's a good deal. They don't fit me right. I don't like the color, but it's such a good deal. They'll sit there in my closet forever. I'll want to wear them, but I can't wear them. They don't fit right. But I got such a good deal and finally, we have a missions drive or I, you know, I take all my stuff and I do. I, I do this very re regularly. I'll take my stuff. I just did it not long ago. And I'll, I'll count 25 shirts. They're going to Salvation Army. I get rid of them. And, and not just my bad stuff. I take some of my stuff I really, really like. And I give that away too. You know what I'm doing? A, I don't want to be stuck on anything on this earth. I don't want to be held down. I don't want to be earth bound. And so in the process of this, in these shakings, we get rid of stuff we don't need. We get rid of attitudes that are not healthy. We change principles of how we relate to other people. We learn how to say, yes, ma'am, you are right again. <laughs> Humor me at least. You haven't learned that yet? <laughs> we retain what is superior, necessary, helpful for living this quality of life. And then, uh, just one more here uh, about shakings. Um, we need to find what's not shakable. And I want you to look at this verse with me. This is in 27, it's going into 28. Now this, once more, the removal of those things which are being shaken as those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving, what? A kingdom that cannot be shaken. You know what can't be shaken? God's kingdom. You know what can be shaken? The church. Is everything in the church in God's kingdom? I would love to say so, but the fact is we believe things, we do things, we have a, we have a certain level where we're capped off. Um, you know, a lot of churches, they, won't, they, they don't give to missions. They will not give to missions. They, they just won't. Um, uh, and, and there's other things. And you have to have a renewed mind. You have to break through some things. We were here, I don't know, maybe 20 years or so before we even had our first missions conference. We had a couple of weekend missions conferences. And, 
And after a while, it catches on. And it's like, you know, God is interested in more than just me or more than just us. And there are some people, they will not give to any mission or missionary that doesn't bless the United States. I say, bless the United States, but don't stop there. Start there, but keep going. Let it go around the world. God's, God's a global God. I'm just using that as, a, as an example. But finding out what is unshakable, this kingdom. And the Bible says we are receiving a kingdom. And this word received means that you have it. It's like, it's like if you give me a $100 bill, and you say, go have a cup of coffee. And I go get a cup of coffee and it's like, I still have most of that 100 left. So I see it two weeks later. I'm still, I'm still buying coffee off that hundred. I see it two months later. I'm still buying a cup of coffee. I see it six months later. Well, I'm getting down there, but I'm still using it. This word, I am living. We're receiving a kingdom. It means we have it and we're living off of it. We, we have been given it. We haven't been given the whole thing, but we've been given a down payment that is enough for us to live this life. And we tell God, I'm, I'm still living off it. It's still good. I have it. There's more coming. But I'm still using I, I, that. That's what the word receives there. It means I take it personally. It's my own. And somebody gave it to me. And God has given to us. And we'll see what he's given in just a moment. But we've got to look beyond what is the obvious. Personal earthly possessions. The Bible says a man's life does not consist of the things that he possesses. And we think sometimes, well, he's got this and he's got that. That's not, that's not who you are. It's, your life isn't about what you possess. Your life is what you have in God. Somebody say amen. And alcohol. And I have to say alcohol and drugs because why do so many people turn to alcohol and drugs? The Bible says wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. I think that's Proverbs 20. Our carnal mind, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Sometimes we want to have everything and by our own natural minds, God is going to blow your natural mind. He is going to go beyond your natural understanding. That's that dimension of revelation. External religion, which we've touched on a little bit. By grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It's not external religion. And it's not ourselves. This parable spoke Jesus unto those who trusted in themselves and despised others. Sometimes we think, well, I don't know anybody else. I don't trust anybody else. But I know myself. I'm going to trust in myself. You're a fool. Fool. Because you can change. And your circumstances can change just like that. Not even to mention maturity levels and such the like. And we need to find that which is unshakable. And the Bible says we've been brought to a kingdom that is unshakable. We need to live by that kingdom and let our life experience reflect that. Then I want... I'll use this in closing, verse 28. Therefore, everybody say therefore. Since we are receiving this kingdom which is unshakable, let us therefore have grace. I love it when Katie sings that song, I'm not going to abuse his grace. It's the only thing that wants to make me change. I love that song. Let us have grace so we can serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Oh, we, you mean we still need that reverence and godly fear that they, yes, we do still need that. Right? Jesus said, don't worry about those who kill the body. Don't fear them. Most of us still fear man or man's thoughts. One little comment will throw us off, lose our identity. That person treated me or said something and we're just like flipped out. It's like, no, anchor yourself in what is true. What is true? I'm born again. I'm baptized. I'm filled with the Spirit. I'm a devil chaser. I'm a chain breaker. I'm a freedom maker. I'm a nation shaker. Those are all true things about us. We have to think and perceive ourselves as God does. We serve Him acceptably with godly fear. How many want to serve God? Just oxymoron on this side. You serve God but we don't have to serve God in that Old Testament way anymore. 
and yet we have to retain this, this fear, this reverence, this respect for Almighty God. Amen? We get pretty casual, pretty common, pretty careless in the life that we live. And we need to be respectful, reverent in our spirit, in our attitude toward the Lord. Amen? He needs to be in us. And if you find somebody that reveres God, just, just stand next to him and let some of that get on you. Amen? As a younger Christian, I just love to be around older people, older men and women of God that walked with God. It's just like, I want some of that. Just uh, They say that a pastor should not just go to his friend's conferences, go someplace else. So I bought a ticket and went out to Connecticut, never knew anybody of those people before. And, and so I'm sitting at a table, and I was young. I was probably, I don't know, in my 30s or early 40s, something like that. And, and so I'm, I'm there. I didn't know one soul, and it was good for me. So I'm sitting at this table, and all these guys are in their 60s, which they're so far over the hill, I thought they were 100 in my mind. you know. And uh, this is what they said. They said. We don't have really anything to give you. We don't have anything to pray over you except just our, our walk with God and Christ-like character. That's all we have. I'm like, that's all you have? Those are, the, those are the riches. I was smart enough. I said, pray for me. Invest that on me. Speak that over me. Pray over me. They didn't even value how strong it was. Amen? That's why you need younger people in the church. And you need older people in the church. The wisdom. God never put an old man's head on a young man's body. Would you stand with me this morning? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are good, you are faithful. Your loving kindness and your tender mercies, Lord, are always over us. And Lord, we're, we want to be brought into this kingdom that is unshakable, especially, Lord, where our state is right now, especially where our government is in our election process and our spiritual mindset of those in our country. Would you say this with me? Thank you, God, that we're part of a kingdom that is unshakable. When I'm being shaken, help me to hold on to what I need to hold on to and let go what I need to release in Jesus' name. Amen? How many want to be a part of an unshakable kingdom? Say amen. Amen. We have it. We're not there yet. You've got to understand something about the kingdom. We don't have it all. But whatever we do have of it is good and it's of God. But there's more of it. Let's press into it. What do you say? Amen. Amen. God bless you.